Hi everybody, my name is Doug Allwater. Welcome to my Essential Latin for the Drum Set Overview video. Before I say one more word, I want to give a big shout out to Zach Albetta, who very graciously credited me in his excellent online video on Latin styles for the drum set. You can find that video on onlinedrummer.com. Look for Zach Albetta, Z-A-C-K-A-L-B-E-T-T-A. He does an excellent job of breaking down the various rhythms and styles. So I'll try not to duplicate his efforts any more than I have to in explaining all of this. As I said in my video collection overview, these videos are not meant to be online lessons. They're in support of my books in order to reinforce or clarify some of the rhythms and examples in those books. The, this video is a brief overview of my Essential Latin Styles book. There's way more stuff in the book. This just clarifies a few main points. I should mention that in addition to all the drum set rhythms in the book, there's an entire section of the book showing the proper bass parts and chordal comping patterns as well. It's not enough to get things squared away on the drums if the rest of the band isn't playing the proper parts, so I've taken care to provide all of this in the book. First of all, I want to emphasize that in order to effectively play these various Latin styles, you need to start considering them in their place of origin rather than the larger umbrella term, Latin, which really is too vague for our purposes. We need to be more specific. It would be sort of like saying, uh, this tune has an American feel. <laughs> what does that mean? Jazz, country, rock, bluegrass? Not really too helpful, is it? In my own teaching and working with university and even professional groups, the most fundamental problem with properly performing these styles is understanding that they really are separate styles from separate countries and cultures, not all part of the same big thing. Think about it. A tune is counted off and the bassist is playing a, a samba groove while the drummer is playing a mambo. So we've got a big problem right from the start, much like a drummer playing a rock groove and the bassist playing a walking jazz line or something. So we need to be more specific. Begin by learning the style's place of origin. For instance, mambo is Cuban, samba is Brazilian, cha-cha-cha is Cuban, bossa nova is Brazilian, etc. Right off, you're going to be able to make smart, intuitive choices as to sounds and rhythmic tendencies because these different types of music have their own conventions. They're typical sounds that you'll begin to get a feel for as you listen. Also, no one learns to really play a style of music by simply learning the grooves from a book. You've got to listen. You'll never be as effective as someone who's done that work absorbing the characteristics of these various styles. By the way, there's a discography at the end of the book to help you know uh, some artists that play these various styles, both Cuban and Brazilian. Before we get started, we need to have a word about clave. Most of you have heard this word and understand it to be a key rhythm in Latin music, which is true, but this is one of the problems with the term Latin music. The term clave, as in key rhythm, really, for our purposes, pertains to Cuban music, and I'll demonstrate that when we play some of the, those rhythms. Some people talk about Brazilian clave. I'm not really fond of that. Um, there are certainly key rhythms in Brazilian music that function in a similar way, but actually this is true in any form of dance music in the world that I'm aware of. So here's a few examples. Uh, first I'll do a waltz and then a polka. So let's see, I'll do it with sticks. All right, then um, polka. We don't call them waltz clave or polka clave, right? Additionally, there's not really any consistency as to what people are referring to when they call something a clave in Brazilian music. Sometimes they're referring to the surdo, the Brazilian bass drum. Sometimes it's the, the tambourin rhythm, uh, that little tiny hand drum. Sometimes it may be the traditional bossa nova rhythm from the late 50s. These are all key rhythms. But I think referring to Brazilian rhythms with a Cuban label adds to the confusion as to which are Cuban and which are Brazilian. That's just my opinion, but it's also based on my experience. 
Uh, not certainly not everybody shares that opinion. Uh, as long as you know what you're talking about, it's fine. But uh, in my experience as a teacher, referring to something like samba clave definitely creates some confusion, at least for people at the beginning of their learning curve. I'll discuss this more uh, when I play these rhythms for you. So. Let's compare some of the most popular Cuban styles with the most popular Brazilian styles. We're going to group them according to tempo so you can see just how different they are. Uh, let's look at the ones that are of a quicker tempo first. So, and also we'll look at the, the most popular ones like the Cuban Mambo and the Brazilian Samba and also uh, Brazilian Bael. And then a, a couple of rhythms that are a bit more contemporary in their origin, uh, the Cuban Songo and the Brazilian Partido Alto. Um, first of all, yeah, first of all the Mambo. One thing I should point out about Cuban styles, you'll see a lot of different labels or names that use essentially the same rhythms. In Cuba, as in other highly developed styles of music, the name of the style has a lot to do with the form of the song. So a mambo has a complex form, usually an intro, some verses, and uh, what in jazz we might refer to as shout choruses, like the coro y, pregu, uh, coro y pregón or the coro inspiración. First of all, the mambo. One thing I should point out about Cuban styles, you'll see a lot of different labels or names that use essentially the same rhythms. In Cuba, as in other highly developed styles of music, the name of the style has a lot to do with the form of the song. So a mambo has a complex form, usually an intro, verses, what we refer to as shout choruses in jazz, uh, where the song gets really revved up, as in the coro pregón or the coro inspiración. Sometimes these sections themselves are referred to as the mambo sections. You know, it's a bit confusing, isn't it? Um, I go into this in greater detail in my book, but for our purposes here, we're looking at a couple of the more common rhythms. So be aware that if you're dealing with a piece of music labeled as a descarga or a fuaracha, uh, they'll usually use the same rhythms found in mambo. Okay, so the first rhythm is the cascara, the rhythm that is traditionally played on the shell of the higher timbal. <laughs> Note that in uh, proper Spanish, it's one timbal, two or more timbales. Now, still the use of the word timbale in the singular sense has become so common that I've even heard native Spanish-speaking percussionists refer to it that way. All right, enough of the Spanish lesson, right? These rhythms are very rooted to the clave, and I'll play them with the clave both in 3-2 and 2-3 forms. So, here is uh, the cascara. Just, I'm just going to play it on the hi-hat here in the 3-2 form. In fact, I'm going to play the clave with it. Okay. All right, here's the 2-3 form. All right, now we'll add the bass drum part. This is referred to as the bomba, which simply means bass drum, or sometimes it's referred to as the tumbao. Strictly speaking, uh, the tumbao refers to the pattern that the bass player plays. But since the bass drum part is basically doubling the bassist part, it's often referred to as tumbao. So, you know, same as the bass part. I mention this because some people get really fussy <laughs> with terminology, but the important thing is to know what we're referring to. Okay, note that we only play beat one at the beginning of the phrase. On repetitions, it, it's omitted, um, as I demonstrate here, playing the 2-3 cascara. Okay. Note that the phrase length may vary. You may want to play one every four bars or every eight bars or whatever the music calls for. We just don't want to play it every bar. Um, it just makes it sound very repetitious and disrupts the, the syncopation. 
If you're working with a conga player, be sure to stay off the toms. You don't want to get into his space. I'm playing clave in my left hand. There are other variations for the left hand shown in the book. However, if you're working by yourself, that is not working with a conga player, you may want to fill things out more on the toms as the song becomes more intense. You can add a, a skeletal part of the conga part um, and it'll sound like this. So. So as a song, uh, because of soloing or otherwise, gets increasingly revved up, or perhaps you're in one of the shout sections of the song, you'll want to switch to cowbell rhythms. Um, that just helps amp the, the whole feel up. The two most common are the mambo bell rhythm, played by the timbalero, or the timbal player, and the bongo bell rhythm, uh, played by the bongo cero, and that's in traditional Afro-Cuban bands. I'll play both of those in the 2-3 clave, by far the most common for these rhythms. First, the mambo bell. All right, um, here's the bongo bell. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna play this one uh, ghosting the notes in between. Um, you know, you can play the clave, it certainly sounds fine, but I think playing the, the um, clave throughout becomes repetitious and kind of overbearing. There are other textures that we want to, to add. So here it is, and I'm going to add the bass drum to it too. So we can add uh, toms to this to simulate the, the conga part as we did a minute ago. As I said, there are lots of variations in the book. Um, and I should say that the songo, which I'll demonstrate in a, in a few minutes, is a good substitute for these bell rhythms. Uh, it's become a very contemporary thing to, to do that, uh, especially in jazz, um, instead of the traditional bell part. Okay, I think that's good for an overview of some of the basic bomba rhythms. We'll return to Cuba in a few minutes. Uh, let's turn our attention to Brazil with the samba, which is usually about the same tempo as the mambo. I feel like I should mention that in Brazil the samba is not specific to tempo though. There are slow styles like samba canção that are at a tempo more like what we would consider bossa nova, but this style, which is wonderful, isn't as well known or as often played outside of Brazil. If you're interested in what it sounds like, uh, check out some tunes by Marcinho da Vila, like Tô Vendo Que Você Me Quer or Ex Amor, two great ones. We're going to concentrate on the faster tempo of samba, which is the more common outside of Brazil. Here are a couple versions. First is the most common one using the familiar cross stick patterns and I'm going to play it both starting with the cross stick on the downbeat and uh, the cross stick starting on the upbeat. I go into the usages of each of these in much more detail in the Samba video and of course in the book too. Let's do the let's do the downbeat oriented one too, and I'll kind of differentiate. All right, the upbeat one. Here's another great one uh, that not a lot of people play outside of Brazil. This is the more, uh, more the sound of the street or the parade samba, the samba de enredo. I go into uh, more detail on this one too in the samba video and also in the book. So here's uh, what we'll just refer to as the street samba. Another fun one that can even be used as part of a solo is the batucada. Here we're combining the surdo, the Brazilian bass drum, in the right hand 
with uh, the part that would be played on the tambourine. We're going to do that on the snare. We can play a cross stick, but here I'll play it with shallow rim shots to make it sound as big as possible. In fact, I'm going to do it two different ways. I'll Soto and the snare drum. All right, so the big sound, right? Uh, it's on page 54 in the book. You do it either way, depending on what kind of atmosphere you want to create. Another popular up tempo Brazilian rhythm that has enjoyed a renaissance in the last several years is the baião. The Bayon, in its most traditional form, is a folkloric style from the inland northeast of Brazil. The instrumentation is usually simple, just an accordion and a triangle, which is often supplemented by a zabumba, a Brazilian bass drum, and a guitar. Sometimes a snare drum is added too. People from the Middle East immigrated to this part of Brazil and added their tonalities, so we see whole tone scales and a lot of altered harmonies. Jazz and pop musicians picked up on this, and so tunes composed by Hermeto Pascual, Edu Lobo, and others became a staple of Brazilian jazz and pop performances. The triangle is a very common percussion instrument in the style. Here we're going to simulate it on the ride cymbal. Now there's a bumba, an instrument similar to a small marching bass drum. I'm going to play it on the floor tom for simplicity's sake. However, when we play it on the drum set, we usually play it this way, on the bass drum. Here's a snare part. Uh, note that I'm pulling the subdivision towards a triplet feel, meaning that the 16th notes are not four even divisions of a quarter note. I go into detail on how to do this in the book, but, but here's what it sounds like. All right, here's what it's uh, like with the bass drum. Here's how we can combine those rhythms and improvise them a bit on the drum set. I'll do some little improvising on the snare drum and then I'll play it with the cymbal too. Now let's compare some slow rhythms. We'll contrast the, the Cuban cha-cha-cha with the Brazilian bossa nova. Both are at about the same tempo, and drummers get into trouble when they jumble them up playing a bossa when a cha-cha-cha is, is called for, or vice versa. Or playing a cha-cha-cha with their hands while playing a bossa nova bass drum pattern. Uh, so let's break it down. Here's a pretty typical way of uh, playing the cha-cha-cha.
Again, there are many more ways to play this in the book. Now, let's look at the bossa nova. Bossa nova is really a type of samba that developed in Rio in the late 1950s. It's got a very chilled out sensibility to it, but it's important to work with defined rhythmic structures that are typical of the samba. Otherwise, we're just kind of rambling aimlessly without much of a groove. So let's look at a couple of rhythms that are played most frequently today. Really, they're just slow samba rhythms. Notice that I'm using a brush in my right hand, which gives it a sound resembling a ganza, that are a shaker. All right, or... All right, so that uh, has a little bit more of a samba feel, that second one that I played. So bossa nova really calls for a more minimalist, a bit looser, jazzy, you know, jazzier approach. So we'll want to leave out some of those notes. But it's important to keep those patterns in mind. Uh, an easy way to do this is to kind of start with every other note. So here's, here's again, I'll play what I played and then I'll leave out more or less every other note. As I said, it's important to keep those patterns in mind and using them for a basis for what you're doing. Otherwise, we just have aimless cross-stick patterns without a real groove. It makes a huge difference. The chordal accompaniment, either guitar or keyboard or both, should be working with similar comping patterns and you're playing with them, creating a subtle but very powerful rhythmic structure. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the original bossa nova rhythm that many people outside of Brazil identify as the one true bossa nova rhythm. Nowadays in Brazil it's not really played as much as the others, um, but I do uh, sometimes also see uh, this referred to as the bossa nova clave. And it's similar to you know, the clave rhythm, but it's not really the same thing. In 1958, um, when the bossa nova first emerged, um, drummers really had not played the bossa nova or the samba at all on the drum set. It was a percussion section thing. And so Dom Homel, who was the drummer on these first uh, sessions, created, along with Antonio Carlos Jobim, uh, this pattern which worked well with uh, the guitar comping patterns that were being used on that particular song by João Gilberto. So, you know, they, a groove was worked out that, that accommodated that very nicely. So this is what it sounds like. You know, I should play it with a, just half notes in the bass drum because that's actually the way it was originally played. Okay. So I, I need to stress that that was a solution to what would work on that particular song. One of the hallmarks of Bossa Nova was a desire to create a new music that had a strong Brazilian character. There was no really consideration of anything Cuban when they put this together. So that pattern, the, the cross-stick pattern that's similar to the clave was really a coincidence. You know, they weren't trying to create something that, that sounded uh, Cuban at all. Uh, it's what worked on that tune. There are also other bass drum variations that are covered in the book, as well as even more perspective on this style. While we're talking about slower tempos, I should also mention the Cuban bolero, which is another style that goes uh, at a similar modern tempo to uh, bossa nova, moderate tempo, I should say, to bossa nova. The bolero is truly a ballad style and usually has a very romantic theme. Uh, the song Besame Mucho is probably the most familiar one. Um, it was even covered by the Beatles in their early days. 
Uh, here are a couple ways of playing it, first with brushes and then with sticks. Like this. Now with sticks. Again, we've got to be careful to avoid mixing or blending these styles. They don't substitute for each other well at all. There are many, many Cuban and Brazilian styles that go beyond the scope of this video. Mostly, I'm trying to demonstrate the differences between the most common styles from Brazil and those from Cuba. Here are two more that are very different from each other, yet fill a similar niche in their respective countries of origin. I'm talking about the Songo from Cuba and the Partido Alto from Brazil. Both are sort of uh, funkified versions of the more traditional styles. So let's start with the songo. It was developed by Jose Luis Quintana, better known as Changuito, on drums and percussion, and Juan Formel on bass when they were both in the band Los Van Van. It was a very successful merging of some traditional Cuban rhythms with funk, resulting in a very angular rhythm but grounded by the traditional bongo bell. Uh, most of us later learned this style from Dave Weckl, who absorbed it during his time with Michel Camilo and then brought it to worldwide prominence with Chick Corea. Here's what it sounds like. It should be noted that there are many better variations. There's no one singular rhythm, despite what you may have seen on the internet. I've got some other ways to play it in the book, but as I stated before, I don't like to duplicate other people's good efforts. So I want to direct you to Ignacio Beroa's YouTube videos on the subject. They're excellent and very complete. Check them out. The one that specifically deals with songo is called Afro-Cuban Drumming Part 7. You know, even better to just buy his DVD, The, uh, the Art of uh, Afro-Cuban Drumming, I believe it is. Uh, so you can check that out as well. Uh, but do take a look at Ignacio's video. And he's very ably uh, aided by Michael Spiro, who definitely knows a thing or two about that music as well. Now, let's turn to Brazil and look at the Parchido Alto. Traditional Parchido Alto is really a type of samba, um, but the, when pop and jazz musicians, bassists and drummers, uh, got a hold of it. They kind of funkified it and uh, showed up on numerous uh, recordings by people like Javon and Gal Costa um, and uh, jazz musicians like Marco Silva. Um, so here's, here's what that sounds like. I'm going to play a couple of different tempos. Stick too. Okay. Um, here's a faster one. Partido Alto. 
Here's another fun Brazilian style, usually referred to as samba reggae. In the book, I also refer to it as bloco afro because it was these blocos that gave birth to it in the, the style, in, uh, that gave birth to the style in Salvador, Bahia. Uh, here are a couple examples. First one is a simpler version, just on snare drum and, and a tom tom. And then the other one uses the three toms uh, simulating a, so a surdo part. Here's another one uh, where we're going to be using the sound of three surdos, which is common, uh, played on tom tom. So the surdo part's like this. Samba reggae, very, very fun. So it's all in the book, you know, along with um, another example that's uh, easily used for just a four-piece kit rather than the three tom-toms. So by now, I hope you've got a better idea of all of this. Um, and I hope uh, you can discern that Cuban music has a very different sound from Brazilian music. I also hope you'll do some more listening to further clarify and reinforce your awareness of these styles. I've got a discography at the end of my book, but speaking in broad generalities, here are some people that will get you started. I'm calling attention to them because their music is easy to find, the rhythms are very direct and clearly played and well recorded, so you can clearly hear what's going on. On the Afro-Cuban side, I like the recordings of Pancho Sanchez. They're very mainstream. Uh, and although there's seldom a drum set used, you can hear all of the percussion parts played very clearly and get a good idea of how the various percussion instruments orchestrate the different sections of each song. For recordings that utilize a drum set, uh, Sammy Figueroa's recordings are really excellent, especially to hear some terrific songo grooves uh, intermixed with some mambo things. The Cuban Jazz Project is great. Uh, as I said, you can't go wrong with recordings with Ignacio Berro and the band. Daphnis Prieto and Horacio Hernandez, perhaps better known as El Negro, are terrific, uh, but perhaps not the very best for people starting out because you're trying to decipher the styles at a traditional level. There's, no, there's nothing less than stellar about their playing. It's just that they're playing at a very advanced level, maybe like listening to Elvin Jones while somebody's trying to learn more about traditional jazz drumming. So starting with something more mainstream is a good idea. Fundamentals first, right? And of course there are many others, but those will get you started with the Cuban stuff. Uh, for Brazilian music, uh, Trio de Paz is highly recommended. Uh, they play things in a fairly traditional style, which is what you want when you're learning about any style. Also, their recordings are easy to come by, widely available in CD form or digital downloads from iTunes and others. Recordings by Eliani Elias are terrific. Oscar, Oscar Castro Neves, excellent. Um, Toots Tillman's The Brazil Project, good, good examples of straight ahead uh, Brazilian jazz styles. Anything uh, by Antonio Adolfo is great. Pretty much everything that he's done for the last 10 years is available. His career goes back a long, uh, long before then. But uh, lately he's had Rafael Barata aboard, who is fantastic. Uh, Paulo Braga, Pascual Mereles, Duduca da Fonseca, Diego uh, Zangado, these are great Brazilian drummers, but there's a more complete discography uh, on the book. As always, I want to say thanks to my friends at Paiste Symbols, as well as uh, the Conservatory of Music and Dance at the University of Missouri at Kansas City. Uh, thanks for the use of facilities. So, until next time, até a próxima, until next time.